everyone welcome to this new pancakes with today we're gonna talk about tradition and innovation with sarah arnold she's the owner of the account the accidental artist it's a very funny story for me i think actually <laughs> i've been following her for as long as i've been on instagram which is not that long actually and um we've been chit chatting for a while but actually we never had a really proper conversation so you guys are going to witness the first real conversation between Ondine and Sarah. Be my guest and send us some questions as we chit chat because I am really good at chit chatting forever. How are you, Sarah? I am good. How are you? How is everything? I just saw some message, but I'm not. I'm going to ignore it. It's like we are actually on. <laughs> my Irish nana said, "Sarah." <laughs> yeah. I think it was. Her accent, yeah, but, but Sarah, just traditional. Let's go for yeah. Sarah. <laughs> yeah, Sarah. Like Sarah. I don't know why. Just, just her accent, I guess. It was so cute. Yeah. She's cute. How are you doing? Yeah. I'm doing really good. And I have a bit of French for you today. <laughs> okay. I know we're going to talk about teaching and teaching on Zoom and traditions. Yes. I wanted to, yeah, pass on something uh, that a famous ballet teacher used to say, but it's in French. And please forgive me if I'm saying it poorly. Prenez-vous par la main. Prenez-vous par la main. Take yourself by the hand. Yes. Because she wanted the student to teach themselves to take the responsibility. But we'll get into that later. But I just wanted to try out my French on you. That was absolutely <laughs> beautiful. I loved it. Oh, merci. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me, how was, how was last year, this beautiful moment where we all figured out what are we going to do? <laughs> yeah, how are we going to connect? Um, yes. It was actually really good, good for me uh, in a lot of ways. Um, I guess I'll start chronologically. When I, when I hit here in California, it was mid-March and... Uh, I felt okay about it because I have a YouTube channel, so I had some lights. I mm -hmm. had I was used to how to manage the camera and how to set it up, but then the other obstacles came because the YouTube videos are recorded and you can edit. You're not connecting with real people, so there there's the difference. I had a little bit of tech experience, but then it became the issue as as the year went on, and and uh, so I teach adults and teens. Mm -hmm. Especially with the teens, they would be on Zoom for school. At the end of the day, they're coming into Zoom at ballet and they have Zoom fatigue. Yes. And so I was looking it in their eyes. Um, so I was trying to, how do I reach across this, this video and connect with them? So at first I uh, found it challenging. I've gotten in a rhythm now after more than a year of what to do. And, um, one of the things is I try to inject levity into the class, which I actually always do in person, mm -hmm. make them wake up a lot, a little, you know, kind of, and just make a joke, maybe make a joke about it and, and get them connected. And when I see them smile, I know that they're with me. Yeah. And anyone that has- so You have screen, to feel the room through the screen. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And um, as a naturally sensitive and artistic person, when I enter a ballet classroom, I have to have the right vibes. I, I feel it on Zoom too. If they're not connected with me, I just don't feel not only fulfilled, but that they're gonna get what I'm saying. Yeah. yeah. They're gonna, they're closed. So one of the main closures on Zoom is when someone doesn't turn on their screen. I don't know if other teachers have experienced that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so I always ask them, could you please turn it on? And sometimes they may ignore me and sometimes they'll put their little microphone on and tell me why they're not doing it. And they might have a valid reason. But I did talk to one of my students who was in another class and she said, oh yeah, one of our ballet classes, no one turns on our video and the teacher doesn't say anything. And I was like, how could that be? And she says, your class is the one most people turn on. I said, well, absolutely. If I can't see you, how can I help you? What's the point? What's the point? Uh, no. You're just giving your class. That's just giving a class. I might as well be a video. So, <laughs> so actually, I was thinking about that. And if that's what you yeah. want, go for a pre-recorded. Don't need a yeah, live box. 
Yeah, so what I like about Zoom, it's allowed all of us dancers and teachers to stay connected in a time of isolation. And I look forward every day to when I teach because I need that too as a person. And I feel like the kids and the adults that take from me, we all made that community. It's allowed us to do it. And so I've learned along the way, um, kind of some, just like I said, some kind of tricks to get them mm -hmm. connected. And that's my main gist is how can we stay connected? Um, and I guess early on, some of the challenges was you're talking and then the music conflicts. Oh. You know, we, we have some of those, right? You had that too? <laughs> I actually at some point I thought we need a group where we share all those lesson learned because we're all going through the same thing. Yeah, that's a really good point. And fortunately for the school I work for, the secretary is, is tech savvy and very, um, you know, like a can do person. She researched this and she made us a PDF. Here's what to do to yes. do this. And so she was very supportive and it really helped us through it. Um, let's see. So some of the some of the the biggest challenge for me is I'm a very hands-on teacher for oh. I cannot touch anybody anymore so I had to learn to be an even better communicator verbally image wise and showing myself mm -hmm. and zoom many of ballet teachers that I know have said it's very exhausting um, and with my adults in particular I'm not sure why um, Maybe it's just the level I teach, you know, like a lower and advanced beginning. If I'm not doing it, they, they, they lose. They don't know what to do, like yeah. a lot of times. So I end up having to do it always with them because um, I want to keep the pace of the class going mm -hmm. is another reason. Um, but last spring, That would make I, sense with the adult beginners because maybe depending on what other activities they're used to, maybe their proper reception is not as um, fine-tuned as what you see with your other students yeah it makes sense and and it is not as many as a criticism i think that even some of the teen students uh, got lost if just because of the technical barrier you're not you don't i mean one of your senses is removed um you know i'm and, not quite and, sure and, yeah like, like for you you're very hands-on and that sense was removed yeah. and for them maybe their sense of learning i, I have a few students as well they learn a lot sense. by actually touching us so I have to do it and she feels on me how I move, then she can cope. Oh, yeah. That yeah, was yeah, removed yeah. as well. <laughs> that, that moved as well. Yeah, I can think of a good example, like dropping your, your lats and your shoulder blades. And like, I try to communicate that on Zoom for, you know, I teach progressing ballet technique and ballet. And I'll be like putting my back to the camera and going, well, can you see how my shoulder blades are moving down? Okay, so then I realized, put your hand there, feel it move down. Because in person you would do that, but yes. you can't do that. So you have to get uh, outside the box, so to speak, and, 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 and rely on uh, whatever you can do, because <laughs> we all learn differently. Um, yeah, I, I think that the students have to see you precisely, and the teacher has to see the student precisely. So that was another constant thing. Can you move your screen back? Can you tilt this up? <laughs> I only can see her hip. <laughs> yeah. I love those, those, those students where you only can see their hips. <laughs> I know. I'm like, I know your room is small, but we got to figure this out. when they're men. <laughs> oh, yeah, maybe so. <laughs> Depending yeah. upon your perspective, right? <laughs> you know, I found a way to teach them what well, this is a good opportunity for you to understand angles and how mm. the audience will see you because the audience will be in many different places. Yeah. So yeah. here you have to move the camera. Oh, that's a really good, that's a really good thing. And that, that uh, leads me into where some of the problem with Zoom is if someone is slightly dyslexic, uh, and they, you know, you, like I, I think there is a dyslexic through movement because over the years I've, I've had students that you say to turn one, they always turn the opposite way. You say <laughs> one leg, they use the other leg, you know, and so that is a problem sometimes on Zoom too. So I, I no longer say right or left. I just say, do the leg that I see on the screen. And then if you make these, this yes. part on bus, then this is quasi or quasi and FSA, FSA. You have it builds that sense of the box around you. Yeah. And I, I think they have to understand that. And you can do that through Zoom. Yeah. Um let's see. Yeah, is, I can't somehow you found a way to actually make it an opportunity to learn things. 
That is the way of the world. <laughs> <laughs> right? We don't make an opportunity. Why you and I, we get along because we take all of this as oh, an op- it's just an opportunity. Oh, yeah, it's or that, annoying. And personally, um, that's what I've always found exciting about dance is the challenge. And as a teacher in particular, you, um, you're walking into a studio of unknowns or a class of unknowns until you get to know them. But um, where's my challenge of helping all these people accomplish something with all these different bodies, different experiences, different levels, different personalities, different learning methods? So Zoom is just another challenge in how to approach a learning method, you know? Keep and we've throwing had... it at us. Keep throwing it at us. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And the positive of it that I really liked is I could just walk into my living room. Oh, I don't have to drive around anymore. But the negative is I really do like to be with people. So we've all, you know, we all miss that. Yeah, contact. it's not the same at all. No, it's not the same. But um yeah, so the eye contact is important. I must, well, my TV's right over here. My big screen TV, but I use for, I must be looking and they must be looking at me just like in class. If you're at class and you give a combination at the bar and the student is looking out the window or talking, that doesn't work. So it's the same on Zoom. I can tell, I can tell if you're sort of texting someone. <laughs> you bet. Let's get tuned in here. Yeah, so there's that moment of tuning in, setting our intentions. And, yeah, but in general, the students are great. And I will say in particular, the adults are the best because they are the most hungry <laughs> and receptive, right? Yeah. yeah, they're there for different reasons than the kids. And so I found, uh, I've been doing some adult workshops on Instagram and all over the world people. And I love meeting the people and I love seeing what their experience are and taking that challenge of not knowing them how to communicate, etc. Anyway. So you, you love go. the challenge. I can see that. I get excited about the challenge. I don't know. Maybe <laughs> You're actually going to look for it. Uh, yeah, I think that's true. I think, that, and you know, uh, you know, you know that I started ballet at 15 and that was a challenge for sure. Oh, I didn't know you started late. Late. I started really late. Yeah. And I, and immediately within the first year, I was wanted to be a dancer. Okay, I have a question it. for you then on starting late. Yeah. Cause mm-hmm. so, so then that will be first-hand experience because you're a teacher now, so you, 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 you've seen it all. Yeah. Do you think that actually starting late could be an advantage? It is in some regard. Um, as I was speaking to um, Suzanne over at Point to Rise about mm-hmm. this situation and our differences because she went through a state-run school in Germany and indoctrinated basically to act a certain way, behave a certain way. I didn't have any of that. So one of the advantages for me was I didn't have a, a psychological, um, almost called brainwashing. <laughs> it's, it's a negative term, but you are allowed. You, you, I couldn't accept as a dancer, for example, I did not like being called a child, not child, a girl and boy. Girls and boys, let's get to rehearsal or let do this, go to the, you know, no, we are adults. I couldn't understand that. So I think as it started later, I never felt like a kid per se. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was a teenager, but when I got into the professional world, I, that was alienating to me. And uh, I think that has something to do with not going through it my whole life. However, in retrospect, I wish I could have started when I asked my mother at nine years old, just because the foundation would have been there. I wouldn't always feel like I was climbing up a rope and looking for ingenious solutions to advance myself because that was the constant struggle to catch up. So let me ask you that if we were to change something, so if we were to allow people at like 13 to 16 to start and give them the foundation at that age, instead of throwing them in a class where people have been dancing for six, seven years, Uh how do you think that would work? So you're saying when an older student uh, starts and they're thrown in with kids who have been taking six or seven years rather than so going back to a class. So instead of, instead of putting them with a class with other people who've been dancing for a long time, mm-hmm. put them in a class where they learn the foundation at their age, at their level. Well, at their level. So the foundation. Uh, yeah, the second is, is <laughs> much more comfortable. Yeah. Because that's what yeah. I've been, because I'm just asking you, because I'm looking actually for people like you who started what we call late. 
because yeah. I found that in terms of body development, it might actually be an advantage because often when we're kids, we, I don't like the term compensate, we adapt, we adapt very easily. And yeah. so then you have kids who've adapted from eight to 13 and created a movement that is not what we're looking for in ballet. And then we have at 13 yeah. to relearn something else. Oh yeah. Rather than what I think happened with you, is you didn't have that prior knowledge. So the no. movement is new. Yeah, it was all new. Yeah, but, either that or we're in an excellent school that stayed on you with a really good progression and you developed the good habits. And as a ballet teacher, uh, you know, I, I would have my studio and I would get kids from other places and I had to explain to them, you're not that level here because they didn't have good training and they had band-aids on to fix it. Yes. And it was fundamentally incorrect. So they had the wrong movement pattern, which is exactly that quote I put up last week from Lisa Howell, uh, you know, uh, you know her from the, ball the yeah. ballet ball um, that said it takes, uh, oh my goodness, 3,500 repetitions to undo a incorrect mm -hmm. body movement. Whereas it only takes what, 750 to do it right. And so that's my concern yes. as a teacher. We have to stop, let's say practicing a pirouette because I'm doing a pirouette workshop that's been on my mind, <laughs> you know, with the rolling your arm open too far or swiveling, you know, stop, mm -hmm. ending poorly. Stop oh, the ending path. poorly, oh my God. <laughs> yeah, ending poorly for the sake of getting double turn in, you know, um, just like Ethan Stifle said, but maybe T, no one wants to see an ugly turn on stage. Okay, do a beautiful one. <laughs> that's, that's nice. We, we're but how many with. people are, how many teachers are actually emphasizing, I'd rather see one and you finish and you close and that's beautiful. Yeah, that is beautiful. I love that sustain. That is awesome. Especially it's, as in a ballet, how many pirouettes actually finish with nothing after not many you mean, you got, no, for the girls right? how many times you have pirouettes in fifth pirouettes fifth pirouettes fifth pirouettes fifth yeah yeah, yeah or yeah. pirouette finishing attitude and something how about pirouette ending in all the second oh yay <laughs> <laughs> there's a good test right or anything i know but... i know i know it, it sounds a little snarky but you know ballet is precision and there's no way around it. I don't agree with dancing about and just creating bad habits. I, I'm concerned as a teacher that you will never get it because you instill that in your body. Not yeah. because I don't like you or because I, I don't, it, it's because it's the essence of classical ballet is precision. There's no other way around it. It is. Yeah, I mean, really, Miss, I mean, true. Miss Elizabeth <laughs> Platel was saying it's fine embroidery. It's detailed, ah. fine, and artistic. I'm, I'm not sure if it was from her or she heard it from someone else, but I, I'll attribute it to Miss Plateau. <laughs> yeah, okay. That sounds good fine, to me. Fine embroidery. So. Yeah, and that's how, actually, Undine, that's what I think of artistry as. That's how I was raised. The technique comes first. The fine embroidery of artistry is laid upon it. That doesn't mean that you don't bring out the inherent artistry of a student as you go along. And there are ways to do that, like, for example, where I teach, and I'm not RAD trained, but the, but the director is. Mm -hmm. When I sub in an RAD class, I use their syllabus. And I see these beautiful exercises at the end after the girls are just doing, girls and boys are doing detailed exercises and they're just, and they're repetitive. They've been doing them for months. But then they go and they do an exercise where they're obviously responding to the music. They'll usually use something orchestrated like I can think of when I sub, they used, um, Oh, from uh, Cinderella, that, mm -hmm. that one that goes da dum da da dee da, and they're just going down up, 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 up and you can see them just and they run up and then they run around, and you go, this is artistry, this is developing art. It doesn't mean you have to stand like a wood doll at the bar, <laughs> but <laughs> you can't move. We are living and breathing, moving, right? But I do really believe technique comes first. Artistry is the embroidery later. And it's an essential embroidery. Otherwise, there's no audience. <laughs> right? Yeah. You're, you're, well, you're saying one thing and the other. You're saying it comes first, but at the same time, you're saying it comes with it. 
It comes gradually. It's just so like, I guess I need to be more like specific. This. Yeah, yeah. I believe that artistry is a component of class that's built into exercises. Let's say port de bras. Mm -hmm. Port de bras is very structurally clear as to what must happen. But if you are taught it correctly, there's artistry built into it. Like yes. I remember in, in, uh, in learning port de bras, Vagadava, you reach your fingertips slightly. Yeah. I never heard that from other people. It was just open. But this breath oh, no, and reach of your fingertips is yeah. artistic, right? Yes. The turn of the cheek. It's not your head laying to the side. It's the lift. There's artist, artistry built into technique. But it, um, I don't know how to explain um, the difference between what I see is weaving artistry into class for the sake of to feel good artistry that does nothing to do with ballet. Does that make sense? It does. And you know what you were talking about is interesting because as I was reading Vaganova and um, Carlo Blasis, I noticed both of them were talking, and Georges George Novet actually also, so 300 years ago. They were. <laughs> <laughs> tradition! <laughs> yeah, tradition. Well, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to that. I, I, it was actually Georges George Novet who um, surprised me with that. He was talking about that ability to expand. Mm -hmm. And in physiology, this is what we call hydraulic amplification, which has not been theorized not now, long ago. Hydraulic amplification, so the ability to actually, um, so it, it is actually tensing up your fascia, but tens tensing is a bad word, um, mm -hmm. but it's the ability to, to put under tension. I see. Your, 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 your fascia in a way that actually expands. And this is, this is actually exactly what we're looking for in ballet. So instead of being there, it's expanding. Yeah. And that was very so, interesting so to see it. In, sorry? sorry? Excuse me. So when you're talking about Jean-Georges Nogueira, that was, is that the, the man that codified? Yes. Or was that, oh, okay, codified for Louis XIV. Yes, for Louis XIV. <laughs> And so when I read that, I was like, oh my God, he's already talking about hydraulic amplification. He doesn't have a scientific word to put on it, but he's already yeah. saying that we need that expansion in the body to be mm -hmm. able to move, change body weight placement, move swiftly, yeah. go up, down, etc. And you see the same thing in Vaganova. Um, well, exactly as you said, when she talks about reaching with your fingertips, reaching mm -hmm. with your head, it's not just tilting. Yeah. It's not just static pose. There's, there's like, I remember one of my teachers saying, balances are not, you're not a statue. It doesn't, it's not as it appears. It's a it's moving. Taking, yeah. Down, Even down, turnout down, is a continuous movement. Adjusting and, and then also about the best natural turners were studied by um, Joanna Nealon, I think, with a group in Florida. Okay. Back in maybe 60s, maybe something like that. But anyway, um, they, they slowed down the films and they mm -hmm. watched the natural turners and they saw natural turners make micro adjustments. Yes. Maybe they're relatively higher, their body. And people are not natural turners, just fall off. They don't have that internal thing. But, but the point is that there is movement all the time and everything that might appear as a static pose to a lay person, a non-dancer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, we're living. Yeah. Well, if you if you study yeah. physics, you know that being immobile doesn't exist because of the immobile? earth. Yeah, uh -huh. it actually oh. doesn't exist. We're on continuous movement, and th that's one thing I was uh, I was looking for is that we increase the study of sciences in the ballet curriculum mm -hmm. because I don't know I don't know in the U.S. but in France, most uh, artists they will be required to do the their high school curriculum that is more on literature and artist well literature history etc etc and they're kind of asked to drop biology physics etc quite early in their high school <laughs> curriculum really and that's the opposite <laughs> yes and the, and the so but i can understand some of it but the problem was for me for for dancers at least I don't don't know for the for the others, but was the more I study physiology and the more I'm thinking, you do need to understand the laws of physics. You do need to understand biology. You do need to understand the laws of cells. I was teaching a class the other day, and some people didn't know what a cell is, 
because I forgot that was too long ago. Yeah, I would say I probably forgot too. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a vague which understanding. Is, but which is yeah. probably okay, but it makes it harder to explain how you build collagen. And then for me, the understanding of collagen was to help them understand how you create, how by creating repetition, you create what we call muscle memory that is actually not muscle memory. Oh, uh, but that's it's a, very in your, yeah. Yeah, because that's, that's a coin phrase in PBT and the t-shirts even say muscle memory. And I have no in-depth scientific or biological background to understand. I would be really interested to know more about the biology of muscle memory. You must do something about that for us, please. <laughs> I will then. That's my next one. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. I'm what? passionate about it. Biological. <laughs> I think it's just so. I just saw a post by um, Trends in Motion account about muscle memories. So that's why it was in the back of my head. <laughs> oh, I see. I see. Yeah, my um, experience with uh, physics. Uh, well, I took it in high school, but, but it, you know, you know is uh, is the book by uh, Kenneth Law, Physics of Dance and mm -hmm. the Physics of Pot and I reference a lot of what he said about I studied his chapter on pirouettes and turns because I, I mean as, I, as a dancer I knew you're going to push from the floor and deliver energy up onto the releve but I, but I read his mm -hmm. interpretation in terms of physics and it's it's very informative and logical and um, I guess that's the dichotomy I see in classical ballet there's logic which is technique and there's artistry yeah. it's inside you and must be cultivated and it relates to music, it relates to stories, it relates to your sensitivity. And then we weave that together to become an artistic athlete. Mm -hmm. It's not two separate things, but, but, but I feel that the technique comes first. You have to have the basis and you weave it in. And later when you emerge out of the as an artist, you're on stage. Or <laughs> you don't, don't go on stage, but you're still excited for what you're doing in class. So you understand so it's, a, it's part of the art form. Definitely. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, hmm. Well, I think what you were going to ask me about tradition. Yes. Yeah, go I'm, ahead. I'm interesting yeah. to know, like, what part of Bali do you think need to be preserved the, the most? Well, let me say the part that maybe I enjoy the most. You've been talking because about artistry a lot, so I think you, you're very into it uh, i love i love the artistry i mean oh. my whole life is evolved around creativity in many forms my hobbies are tied into that as well but um i also i'm also have an analytical mind so i think the precision is good yeah. anyway yeah. what i think should be preserved is is i think First of all, it's always been a performing art, and it started mm -hmm. that way in Italy and France, later to Russia. <laughs> um, so, but the things I love the most about it that are unique are the manners. I love mm -hmm. the reverence at the end of class, and often we have to skip it because we run out of time. I love the port de bras. I love the air pommel. I love, love those details that come into it, that take it out of being... Uh, something like exercise and mm -hmm. i have often said i would never have started ballet if it was purely exercise my whole family played tennis i did not like tennis i did not want to be out in the sun and sweating <laughs> so <laughs> i went in the pool while they played tennis and then i just discovered dance and i was like okay so it's okay to sweat because this is artistic this is this is a self-expression work of logic yeah. So to me, it's very logical, and I respect the progression of exercises, and those are handed down through tradition. No matter where you go, you're going to get the same and the same sequence mm -hmm. that feels safe, that feels cute, and it, it's logical. Um, let's see. I, I think uh, what else is logical is the uh, relationship I mean, not logical, but traditional is the relationship between the teacher and the student mm -hmm. that's understood. But I think all teachers and students need to be mutually respectful of each other. 
Um, but that's something that is a tra tradition that the teacher is in charge at the teacher. They're not going to abuse you. They're not going to say cruel things to make themselves build themselves up. And we have all experienced that. We've all seen that. Um, so I, I hope the original tradition of classical ballet did not originate from that. <laughs> I will assume. I would agree what do you that. Yeah, yeah. I and, don't think and hopefully did. they're more caring teachers than abusive teachers. Yeah. I, but I think I, the I problem don't... is we're not in an environment where we speak up enough. So some people have been allowed to continue mm -hmm. behaving this way when we definitely need to continue our yeah. efforts to allow people to speak up so that this is stopped even before it stops. Yeah. Right. And, you know, on a on a cell basis, we want to get down to the cellular level here. We can speak yes. out as a collective in the world, but does that really help that person going to class, child or adult, who feels put down or abused in class? That If they can't leave that teacher and find a better school or better class, then that's something inside them that's not allowing them to break that bad connection. Mm -hmm. That's how I see it, that it's almost like a, a relationship, um, what do you call it, codependent. Yes. And, and uh, yeah, so, you know, and, and we all have different personalities. My personality has a hard time understanding. I can understand it, but I would never do it. I, I, I have been in a ballet company um, where the very first experience, the director was abusive and I was a scapegoat mm -hmm. for the year. I left after four months. I said, I'm not doing this. And other ones, I was, I was a scapegoat. Well, good on you. Well, that sucks for you. <laughs> I'm not going to stay. But that's, that's what I think That's the, mm -hmm. we can do on our own individual level. There are plenty of teachers out there. And now with Zoom, there are even more opportunities. I know it's not quite as great as being in person, but it is a resource. And, yeah. Yeah. and you know, somehow I feel we like have to you, do our own personal you, you found that courage because you were like late starter. So you were not. We're not in in thinking that you have to, <laughs> yeah, you have to take on whatever okay. is thrown at you. Yeah, that's a really good point. That's a really good point. Yeah, yeah. And I, I and, don't know, uh, I wasn't there. I'm just assuming. Yeah, I know. It's, I think it's really hard if you uh, felt or if you're just maybe as a child at a school for a very long time and you're reaching for some part goal, and you continue to stay there because of that, but you're not treated well, and you've no. other ones advanced for you, or maybe whatever reason, they don't connect with the teacher, or there's some resentment somewhere. Yeah, that's hard. It's hard to leave. It's hard, but when that happens, there is not one person that's being abused, it's collective. So, mm, good point. We, we need to continue our efforts to make people feel that it is okay to speak up, and it is not okay to be abused, but I think probably what we need to start with is what does it mean, abusive? Because mm -hmm. there is a difference between pushing the dancers to go further their limits and an abusive way of doing it. So um, right. I think sometimes it's not really clear. I remember last year um, a school in North um, England closed and one of the students said yeah now in in hindsight there were things that were not normal ways that the person was looking at us that were not normal places where the hands were put during class that now i know are not normal but back then i did not that's why i never said anything oh i see that was and they so didn't that have comparison or perspective yeah 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 yes. yeah with that person always at class, that so should they have their hands here or not? I don't know. Yeah, it sounds like it's crossing the line. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Absolutely. But we need to hear the things so that we can help them. We need to really listen to what they are saying. Why is it that they did not speak up? Or if they spoke up, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. what was the reaction? And I think we're getting there. I mean, it's hard to be patient for those things because it should, should stop right away. It should never happen, actually. It should not even stop.
I mean, I can I can think of things as my first teacher returning uh, to class and her setting up a situation that was competitive between me and another student. Mm -hmm. And it was really inappropriate because it was, it was born from her jealousy that I went somewhere else. <laughs> no. All I did was go to college. Yeah. <laughs> and come back, which, which a lot of, uh, in, some people are, well, inherently insecure, but it's a matter of recognizing it, right? And dealing with it and being honest and respectful. Yes. So, but if you really love to teach, you're not going to have those issues because you get this joy from imparting and sharing. That's one of the things that I've always found is this beautiful about being a ballet teacher is that I find when I connect with a student, regardless of age, it crosses generations. And that, yes. that's amazing to me. I can find it with a five-year-old. I can find it in one of my workshops the other day, one of the, the dancers came in, she says, I just want to let you know I'm in my 40s. I just started laughing. I said, that's okay. I'm in my 60s, come on. <laughs> Yes. you are a baby so <laughs> <laughs> I mean you know so it's like it doesn't matter what age you are. we all have this this wonderful of moving together in this classical ballet form yeah yeah, yeah. but it, yeah in terms of uh, anatomy and studying things that aren't artistic you know because I started late I, I did go that way to any method I could find or teacher after, after mm -hmm. a few years of, you know, my basic training, more probably when I was, yeah, I was more when I was a professional, a teacher came to a company class that I was in and I latched onto her and I have known her ever since um, because she was into whatever works. And she mm -hmm. even was written up in a dance teacher now, now magazine and called Inspector Gadget. No, I'm saying, well, well uh, um, a play off of that, like that she, she was ballet teacher gadget or something and you know yes. it was kind of meant to critique but they also loved what she did and um so you know an, a knowledge of anatomy and and and, and taking some whatever it is to make the student understand and, and even on zoom too you know you grab something to get your point across and uh it's fun and but anatomy um not every ballet teacher is comfortable referencing that some like to use imagery more you know whatever yes. works I, oh uh, well when it comes to how do you share it with the students it's really up to you knowing what works for them yeah yeah or if you don't know them <laughs> you just try it out <laughs> and you find um, out what resonates someone is saying this has made me want to come back to bali after 30 years i am glad to hear that and That's hello great. suzanne Oh, you're still here. We have a little technical problem. Oh, you're back. Can you hear me? I'm just gonna wait a little to see if we can connect back. Can you hear me? Because I've lost the sound. Just bear with me, guys. We're gonna get Sarah back. because I really wanted to ask her one last question. I wanted to ask her what was her proudest moment as a teacher. So let's hope we can reconnect. This is the beauty of the Instagram live is that we never know what's going to happen. And now I feel like I'm on TV and you know, you have to come up with something when the technical problems happen. Can you hear me, Sarah? Because I can't hear you anymore. It seems that we have a problem. Maybe I will not be able to ask my last question. I feel a bit sad about that because I really love this question. Let me try again, see if I can do something about that. I am sorry, guys. Just have to bear with me a little bit. And I am just trying one last thing to see if I can get Sarah back 
with us that would be amazing if we can have her back i am so sorry i don't know how many times i said it <laughs> i think too many people are on the internet you are back finally i mean oh, i was I trying to sort of talk i know but i couldn't hear you, you still I know, and you were frozen to me, but that <laughs> happens every time I do a live. <laughs> oh, sorry. Sometime yeah. after some time, it no. does that. I wanted to ask you, because I want to finish on a happy note, because we went a little bit on the gloomy sure. and the ugly of the ballet world. Let's go back to the beauty of the ballet world. I wanted to ask you, okay. what is your proudest moment as a ballet teacher? Hmm. There have been so many, and there it's really actually quite simple. I I think that like many ballet teachers, I you have someone who you train and has all this talent, and then they go on to become a dancer, which has happened. Mm -hmm. That's rewarding and exciting to see and watch their career. But I think it's more to me, the daily successes of, and it just relates to your own ego. <laughs> <laughs> the fact that I say something and that it helps someone do that particular step mm -hmm. or better. I get so happy. I am so happy. So I get a lot of happy moments more regularly and nothing really sticks out a lot because it's it's more just the joy of us sharing that moment oh my god gosh you did what i asked and what i thought of work for you yeah i mean that to me is so rewarding i can pretty I can um, that so much yeah you can i mean and there's never not, not a big moment and i'd say i'd say you know one of the just is negative but but interesting it ties into talent and not talent you know that that statement that um, hard work trumps talent. Mm -hmm. I find that's been true in my career. Yeah, and I think I, I'm example. I don't feel like I came as old. I worked really hard, and um, to do what I did, and I've never stopped learning. So the rewards is learning pass that on and then mm -hmm. you see that now and that it that that the ballet requires perfection it's unattainable so let's just keep plodding along and have a good time <laughs> at it uh, as we go right <laughs> yeah and it's beautiful to dance to the music and and within your technique comes freedom and artistry yeah. and there's little bits of as you go along yeah definitely yeah, I can relate so, to so much of that. Yeah, and yeah, sure. Hard work and smart work trumps talent because talents only get you somewhere. Right. The re the requirements of such a yeah profession yeah. as you know. being a ballet dancer requires you to be able to keep going and keep pushing your limits, and so talent is. I don't, I'm not even sure I understand to be... how to define talent, actually. Is that just the pull that you have without working on it? What was that? So, like, how would we define talent? Is that the pool of skills and capability that we have without really working on it? Then in that case, that's finite. That's finite. Which is why hard work from talent. Yeah. You know, I feel that there's what we used to call... I would hear teachers when I was first starting, oh, so-and-so has a beautiful facility. And they meant body, flexibility, line, blah, 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 proportion, right, feet. And so there's that. But I've had those empty vessels, those beautiful things, and they didn't have the motion it took to go beyond a certain level. Um, and so that was disappointing to me because you see that. And so I learned to forget about that. <laughs> Let's go for the people who are motivated and hungry. They may not have that, but I love watching you dance on stage. Yes. 
Yeah. And when I created LA, they were fantastic in carrying that show. So there are different types of dancers, different types of places they're going to go, and it's your own journey. Um, so don't disregard someone who doesn't have a perfect body because you never know where they're going to go. So few do go profession, professional, and, and that's where I differ in teachers that put all their eggs in one basket mm -hmm. that only matters who the students are that are going to be professional because dance then no longer is for everybody. And that's, uh, that's, a, that's a bad thing. And the teacher should because be because so student. Much. Mm -hmm. Unless you go for private <laughs> classes, and then that's okay. But both of my parents were teachers, yeah. and one thing they taught me is when you have a class of 20, they're all your students. They are all your students, and this is the other thing. Everybody pays for that yeah. class. If they're in a paying recreational school or even a professional school, they have to pay. It's a school ballet. It's a freshman school. It's very expensive. Yes. They only take certain people. You know, everybody deserves the same amount of attention. Yeah. Because they're paying you. If you just want to bring it down to a mercenary level, you are <laughs> the servant of that paying person. Yeah. When are we ever going to learn that? And when you can cultivate the talent or coax that out of somebody, then you have succeeded. And if you coax that out of someone who maybe is um, even autistic, Mm -hmm. you there are other challenges besides physical in dance or someone that is you know extremely shy or there's different things and um you know i'm just going to say this i feel like one of my special qualities as a teacher is i can enter a room and i from the students i can tell who yeah. is withdrawn who intimidated by another and I try to bring that out because that's part of dance psychologist but in order to dance you have to flower you have to yeah. have these things out of your way and feel safe yeah okay I have to admit now I really want to take one of your classes <laughs> <laughs> you are so passionate about it that I've been thinking okay can we just start a class right now I just, just want to take classes <laughs> I am passionate about it, and I did, did try to get away from dancing when I quit. Yeah, I, I did try to get away, and I, and you know, I um, I've said in other interviews, like, like I ended up coming home from Europe while I was dancing. I thought, this is it. I'm done with this. <laughs> I was, um, you know, no, musician and an actor, no dancer category, and I went, oh my. So I became a ballet teacher. I still dance but then I thought I don't know maybe I'll just you know, do this but it never if you have the passion it never leaves you I don't I think know. unless somehow it's ruined, I'm exactly like I you hope I it tried to put value away from me and then it came back right to my face <laughs> is that right yeah. really I want to hear more about that <laughs> yeah. well you know I would love yeah. to continue that conversation with you with less people watching us um and I really okay. would love to see if there are more projects that we can do together because I really feel we're so connected at so many levels that that would be extremely interesting if you're up for it. Okay, I'm totally up for it. And, I, and, and my request is for you to do the cellular level of muscle memory. And I am totally in the dark. Definitely. Yeah, and I was, you probably lose. I'm reading a book that is the belief of, no, sorry, the biology of belief. And I wasn't expecting that mm -hmm. it's going to go to the cellular level of how cells work together as a community to understand how the environment is actually the most important things in our development. And that's why beliefs are so important. I wasn't expecting when I opened that book to get into the biology of belief. So now I want to go into yeah. the biology of turnout. Okay, so... Okay, so is that book going to tie into how it shapes your brain? Is that part the, of that biology? The premise is that the environment is the most important um, mm. uh, factor in your development okay. rather than genetics. Mm -hmm. Genetic is the blueprint. Oh, so, so um, genetic is the blueprint That's and the map that the body uses to understand what to do when the environment pushes in a direction. So, 
and uh, yeah, I was a psych major. So I remember the argument of nature, nature versus nurture. Yes. So nurture would be the environment. Yes. And, and, and uh, that was an ongoing debate. But that's another subject, right? <laughs> yeah. It's basically going Very in the direction of epigenetic where, yes, DNA is important, but DNA is basically, it's, it is just a map that tells the cells right. when this happens, you can go this way or that way or this way. Because uh -huh. your genes have decided, you, you have three directions. You are a different person, so you have three other directions. And another person will have others. But rather than the DNA has already shaped the direction to which you're going. So it's, it's quite interesting because it really tells you how much your environment is actually important. So that's why you need to nurture having um, joyful people around you. That's why you need to take care of how you talk to yourself. Mm, absolutely. absolutely. And, and in the ballet world, yeah. that would make a huge difference if we recognize that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. In the way we teach, yeah. in the way we receive teaching, I, so. I, I, we've all been times in this, this, this past year has been hard times yeah. and how we talk to ourselves is really important and create that intention or just dealing, putting negative thoughts out, putting positive energy out, how you keep discipline that way it's really tough it is yeah it is but so oh, it's first i'm magical. gonna talk about <laughs> muscle memory You're welcome. I'll do that. okay definitely i want to know about that <laughs> because that's my thing and, and in anything i just want to add that after last spring once i finished up teaching that school year i was teaching advanced ballet mm -hmm. and adult ballet and progressive ballet technique this year we dropped ballet because I didn't want to go in person. Um, and so another teacher did that. that was younger. And I wanted to wait to the vaccine. I'll tell you the truth, kind of relieved. I found the advanced ballet difficult to teach in a small space. So I really enjoyed teaching the PBT that adapts, yes. conditioning adapts really well yes. to yes. Zoom. And the adult ballet is fine too. Um, but a two hour advanced class was difficult it in is, my though. house. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I just wanted to add that about Zoom in terms of what was successful and what isn't. And uh, we're gonna rally on with muscle memory and conditioning <laughs> classes, thank you. <laughs> well, let's keep embracing challenges as opportunities. I love your mindset. You're such a beautiful soul. Thank you. Yeah, that's the only way. And learning is the key to, to joy, I think. Yes, it is. I'm keep trying to share. I can't thank you thank enough you so much. for sharing all of this with us. That was a wonderful conversation. I want to thank everyone for joining. I know people were coming and going. It's the beauty of the IG Live. You can just catch up. And of course, I'm going to publish it on the account so everybody can follow your followers, my followers, new people, everybody. Yay. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Okay. I will now. Thank Have you. Have a good day. Good night. Bye-bye. All right. You too. Bye-bye. Thanks so much for having me, Andine. Thank you.